So, buenos días a todos. Eh, es un placer este, estar con ustedes una vez más en Frontiers in Genomics. Y el día de hoy tenemos eh, la participación de la doctora Eli Tanaka. Eh, ella es para los que trabajan en el área de eh, regeneración tisular y en el área de desarrollo, obviamente una persona muy conocida. Y eh, es una investigadora que eh, se formó primero como bioquímica. En la, obtuvo su licenciatura en la Universidad de Harvard, luego hizo su, eh, su doctorado en la Universidad de California en San Francisco bajo la dirección del doctor Kirchner y eh, ahí creo que fue donde se introdujo un poco a, lo, a la biología del desarrollo y trabajó en la, pues, realmente en el descubrimiento de los elementos reguladores de la diferenciación embrionaria. Y después hizo un postdoc en uh, University College en, en Londres con el doctor Jeremy Brock, en donde también trabajó en, en, en modelos de desarrollo embrionario y en particular del sistema nervioso central. Y empezó su carrera como investigadora independiente en el Instituto de Biología Celular y Molecular, de, Molecular y de Genética del Max Planck en Dresden, eh, donde eh, empezó a trabajar sobre problemas de regeneración de la médula espinal y llegó a ser director de ese centro y después, este, más recientemente, se mudó a la, al Instituto de Patología Molecular de Viena, en donde ha estado trabajando y su modelo de trabajo es, como pues, bien lo saben los que trabajan en, este, en Biología del Desarrollo, es el ajolote y en, el, en este modelo del ajolote ha realmente podido eh, hacer enormes avances en entender cuáles son los mecanismos moleculares de la regeneración eh, tisular y, cuáles, y ahora también este, ha participado en el, uh, en el entendimiento de cómo se organiza el genoma de Genopus. Ayer tuvimos una magnífica clase acerca de eso y fue realmente este, pues para yo creo que muy, muy ilustrativo y una claridad absolutamente extraordinaria. La doctora Tanaka pues, ha sido es, reconocida por su labor en diferentes, eh, de diferentes maneras y es miembro de la Academia Europea de Ciencias y también re ha recibido numerosos premios. Eh, es también editora y revisora de muchísimas revistas de alto nivel, este, a nivel internacional y bueno, pues con esto quisiera yo pues dejar introducida a la doctora Tanaka. And Eli, I really, and we really thank you very much for accepting, participating under these weird conditions. And we would have liked you to come here, but well, maybe for another time we will invite you to come. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, be able to uh, present and to interact and uh, yes maybe someday in, in in person it would be very nice uh okay so let me share my screen okay so today in the uh second um lecture i wanted to talk about the work using single cell sequencing approaches uh to analyze um cell identities uh during Um, limb regeneration. Oops. So, uh, so again, here's our animal of choice. This is the Mexican axolotl, uh, Ambistoma mexicanum, uh, which can regenerate its tail, its limbs, uh, the jaw, and various internal organs. And we have particularly been focusing on this process of limb regeneration, where you amputate the limb and you form this blastema of cells that grows to replace the missing part of the limb. So it's really how the mature tissue generates that first bump of the blastema that has been a central question in our field for um, many years. So uh, regeneration is really fun to work on because uh, now we have many to uh, molecular tools to work on it, but it also has a very deep classical history. And I'll refer to a few of those kind of classical experiments that really help us to study the system. And uh, also uh, the animal has a large genome and large cells, which sometimes helps us uh, with respect to imaging um, the process of regeneration. <clears throat> 
Uh, as I mentioned, we now have a full molecular genetic toolkit. CRISPR-Cas9 works very well in our system. It's very easy to make transgenics and also knock-ins into the genome. And uh, we use live imaging to follow the cells um, as they enter into the blastema and form the blastema. So as I mentioned, it's this structure that you can see here uh, in the histological section or here in a whole mount microscopy image at, that forms at the end of the amputated limb. Here you can see the bones and then here's the amputation plane. This uh, cluster of cells covered by epidermis called the blastema, this uh, group of cells executes regeneration. So of course we want to understand how the cells from the mature tissue form the blastemas. So which cells from the mature tissue, how is this triggered by amputation, and then how is their growth appropriately controlled? Uh, so mostly uh, today we'll be discussing the first aspect. And what uh, made the situation difficult to, uh, to address that question is that the mature limb, of course, is a very complex tissue that has many different tissue layers uh, and it's composed of cells of many different identities. So for example, here's the epidermis in a section of um, the mature limb. In pink, in this case, are the fibroblastic cells labeled by the PRX1 antibody. Uh, these cells would be considered dermis. Then here are muscle fibers, uh, muscle cells, and in between the muscle cells um, will be uh, muscle satellite cells. Here you can see a bit of bone. So there are many, many different cell types. Um, in the limb. On this section, you can see actually these PAC7 positive satellite cells that are sitting between the muscle fibers and act as the muscle stem cells uh, for regeneration. So how do we deconstruct um, what each of these cell types or which of, the import, uh, which of these cell types is important for forming the blastema? So the first approach is that we took now quite some time ago was having made a GFP transgenic that expresses GFP in all cells um, of the body, uh, we took advantage of the fact that the axolotl has a very large egg. So you can see here, this is a neural stage embryo um, that's three millimeters in diameter. So we could learn from our longtime collaborator, Hans Epperlein, who's a neural crest embryologist, how to cleanly um, transfer um, the cells from a GFP embryo to an, uh, a host, an unlabeled host embryo in order to label eventually the cells that will form these different cell types um, in the limb. And uh, from, uh, so we could make green, uh, limbs with green muscle, green dermis, uh, green Schwann cells, green epidermis. And in that way, uh, we could track what these green cells did after amputating the limb and we could see that epidermis formed epidermis, Schwann cells formed Schwann cells, cells from the muscle formed the muscle, and that cells from the dermis seem to be partially uh, multipotent in that um, cells from the dermis uh, could form cartilage. And this, uh, this uh, result in, in, in this um, observation had been really for, uh, foreseen by uh, previous work by um, Dunis and Namenworth who had transplanted bits of mature skin uh, into irradiated animals in classical uh, studies. So um, in, in essence, uh, through this mapping, we were able to show that cells do not become pluripotent during regeneration. Mostly uh, each tissue um, regenerates itself, except that the dermis shows some multipotency. Now, another very uh, cool and interesting um, a classical experiment that I always like to point out is how does the limb actually regenerate the right amount? So what does it uh, understand about the position of the amputation and how much uh, uh, tissue should be regenerated? And this was a very interesting experiment performed by Butler where he amputated the limb and then fused this piece of the cut uh, wrist back into the body cap and into the body flank and then allowed this to kind of heal and then amputated the circular limb here. So here he has a normal, the normal amputated limb, but then here he has an amputated limb that has the wrong polarity. So this would be the hand and then here's the upper arm. So I guess the question is, does that regenerate a whole body uh, including a head from there? 
or not. And this is the result he got. Instead of regenerating the whole body, uh, cut at this amputation plate and then regenerates the um, lower arm and the hand. So this told us uh, something about the information system um, in the axolotl, uh, in the salamander, and that is cells here at the amputation plane realize that their upper arm, but then some of the cells as they go into the blastema then are uh, reprogrammed, let's say, and induced to form the cells that are of lower or more distal identity than the amputation plane. And so this uh, led to the, uh, this, uh, this uh, name, the rule of distal transformation, where in normal regeneration, you amputate and cells uh, regenerate more distal cell identities. Now, um, going uh, one step further, as, as I told you in the beginning, the arm is composed of many different tissues. And in fact, these different tissues are contributing cells to the blastema to regenerate themselves. So we asked the question, which of these tissues in the limb are obeying this rule of distal transformation? Do all tissues obey this rule of distal transformation or only some of the tissues? So again, we used um, animals where, uh, in this case, it was a transgenic animal uh, where uh, this transgene was driven in muscle cells. Uh, and so we then took uh, and amputated the arm at the wrist and took this hand blastema from the transgenic animal, transplanted onto an upper arm stump, and then allowed the thing to regenerate. And uh, when um, this regenerates actually a normal, uh, normal um, uh, shaped arm. Um, and interestingly, if you look at this, we have green muscle, not only in the hand, but also in the lower arm and the upper arm. So although the transgenic muscle progenitors came from a hand blastema, that those progenitor cells were able to make upper limb muscle. So the muscle cells don't obey the rule of distal transformation. Now, in contrast, if we use as a donor, a limb in which the connective tissue fibroblasts, these are the descendants of lateral plate mesoderm are labeled. And, and then we do the same experiment, transplant a, a transgenic wrist blastema onto an upper arm stump and allow that to regenerate. Then these connective tissue cells uh, really only form the hand and they don't contribute to lower arm and upper arm. So doing a series of these kind of experiments, uh, we could then uh, conclude that this connective tissue, these are the dermal fibroblasts, the fibroblasts sitting between all the different tissues these cells um, are the cells that somehow know their position and only regenerate cells more distal uh, to the amputation plane. So we became highly intrigued and interested in these connective tissue cells. Uh, this is just a control. If we take an upper arm blastema transplanted into an upper arm stump, then actually all of the cells, uh, the, the upper arm, lower arm and hand are, uh, um, have contribution from the GFP expressing cells. So we're very intrigued by these connective tissue cells. Uh, they're the key cell type for analysis in our view. And so just to summarize the key cellular properties for limb regeneration, fibroblasts remember their position, their descendants in the blastema can acquire more distal identities. And then, okay, let's uh, talk again about this tissue differentiation potential. So, uh, Josh Curry then made a brainbow transgenic axolotl. And again, he performed a lateral plate mesoderm transplant in order to selectively label these lateral plate mesoderm um, descendants in, in the digit, in the axolotl digit. So here we're only looking at what we would call connective tissue. These are the cartilage cells, uh, peri perichondrial cells, pericytes, and then here around here are dermal fibroblasts. And then uh, since it's a digit, he's able to use the confocal microscope to look through the entire digit to be able to track actually individual cells as they migrated to form the blastema, proliferated, and then re-differentiated, regrew uh, the um, missing part of the digit tip. So I'm just gonna show you the movie now. So you can see all these cells start growing and forming the new cartilage rod. And I'm sure you couldn't follow single cells, but uh, Josh looked at these movies extensively 
and uh, uh, to follow what single cells were doing. And uh, this, uh, he could generate these kind of trajectories, uh, which showed us some very interesting pieces of information. So the color co code of the line is the origin of the cell. And so you see these green cells are coming from the periskeleton. So the cells wrapped around the um, cartilage. They migrate across the amputation plane very early, and then they go to the tip of the blastema, and then they're dis this cell divided once, and one descendant formed a periskeletal cell, uh, but the other descendant contributed to the regenerating cartilage. And similarly, a cell that originated in the dermis and that crossed the amputation plane early, migrating into the blastema, went all the way to the tip of the regenerating digitive. So that means that, that um, this cell was sitting right underneath the epidermis um, of the, uh, the, of the uh, blastema. And again, the descendants of this original dermal cells, cell contributed to periskeleton and to cartilage. Now, interestingly, um, if a dermal cell um, was further behind the amputation plane here, and so then it took longer until it was activated. It, it migrated slowly, but it crossed the amputation line uh, later than this early wave. Then those cells tended to end up on the lateral surface of the blastema, not at the tip, and they remained as dermal cells. And then finally, I'd like to show these gray lines. These are the chondrocytes that were um, in the cartilage rod already at the amputation plane. Now, for many years, people were saying that the chondrocytes contribute to regeneration because when they labeled animals with bromodeoxyuridine, they could see that chondrocytes were dividing. And we could see that too, that chondrocytes divided after amputating the limb, but these cells are not migratory. So none of them actually crossed the amputation plane. And so they didn't end up contributing to um, the re new regenerating cartilage. It was really um, all the peri uh, perichondrium and uh, dermal cells migrating into the blastema that generated then a multipotent cell that produced the new cartilage. So these are what these kind of lineage trees look like over time. Um, and so you can see that a, a, a cell that starts in the perichondrium ends up switching and, and uh, forming cartilage cells. Here's a bipotent cell. Uh, and uh, uh, these are, uh, um, so you can see that cells gain some plasticity, at least the connective tissue, dermal fibroblasts and periskeletal cells uh, gain some plasticity when they go into the blastema. The other uh, important point from the movies is that most of the fibroblasts within a 250 to 500 micron zone behind the amputation plane migrate to the uh, amputation plane to make the blastema. Uh, this was very important for us to know because when we started wanting to do uh, transcriptional profiling of this process, we needed to know which cells were actually making the blastema so that we could compare those cells and sitting in the mature tissue with the cells that start generating the blastema to be able to compare uh, the pre-blastema state to the blastema state. So um, based on this knowledge, uh, Prayag Murawala made a transgenic Crelox reporter animal where he could drive a, a tamoxifen-inducible Cree um, construct with the PRX um, uh, uh, promoter, which uh, drives gene expression in um, these fibroblasts and connective tissue. And then we crossed it to an animal that we generated where a constitutive promoter, a beta actin promoter, drove a phlox GFP stop and then a cherry. So this animal is green until it's exposed to tamoxifen, this double transgenic, in this double transgenic. Uh, and then this CRE is activated, and then um, the connective tissue cells uh, then start to express cherry. So using that, uh, we could then fax sort out the cherry positive um, fibroblasts, uh, both from the mature limb as well as at different time points um, of regeneration. And I think I mentioned this uh, yesterday, uh, so regenerate, uh, or was it? Uh, anyway, uh, 
the cell cycle in these X levels is very slow. So it's, uh, it's four days. Uh, one cell cycle takes four days. So this is actually a very high resolution time course of regeneration where the time points are separated by less than one cell cycle. And uh, so uh, then we performed at this time, it was fluidine based smart seek uh, sequencing of single cells and each dot here uh, represents a single sequenced uh, cell. Then we performed analysis uh, looking at the transcripts that um, can account for the um, uh, for differences uh, between cells. And so here we use diffusion component three and stratified the cells according to diffusion component three. And uh, we see that the cells in the mature uninjured limb are very heterogeneous. Um, they're spread over a big, um, a large distance on this axis. And this probably reflects the fact that these fibroblasts are sitting in many niches. Some are sitting next to the epidermis, some are sitting next to the nerve, some are sitting inside the muscle tissue. And then, uh, and then as the cells enter into the blastema, they become more and more similar with each other. So they lose heterogeneity um, as they enter into the blastema. Okay, so, um, so um, we then um, looked at this time course of regeneration. Uh, so you can see here the color coding again. So these are the cells that were in the, sitting in the mature limb. And then um, this is kind of the time course going, uh, the cells in the time course. And uh, by then, uh, looking at geo annotation of, of what kind of transcripts were enriched in the transcriptomes of the early versus um, regenerating cells, we could see that the pre-regeneration cells are expressing a lot of extracellular matrix and basement membrane, which makes sense for fibroblasts. And then in this first phase of regeneration here, we see signature of an inflammatory response, growth factor activation, and ECM disassembly. Uh, then we see proteolysis and ECM disassembly, cell division as we start getting the blastema and cell proliferation. And then eventually as the cells start redifferentiating the limb, we start to see gene expression signatures of ECM organization and skeletal system development. This is just another representation of this kind of, uh, of, of uh, this kind of annotation. So you can see the distribution where uh, for each of the, um, uh, of the categories, we can make a kind of score of what percentage of the canonical genes represented in the ECM uh, transcripts are expressed um, by each individual cell. So you can see a high proportion of the ECM genes are expressed in the cells in the mature tissue going down during regeneration, inflammatory response, ECM disassembly, proliferation, cell division, and ECM organization. So this was a very nice narrative of what happens um, during regeneration. Now, um, you know, when, when you regenerate a limb, uh, you generate this blastema, which looks very much like a regenerating limb bud, except that it's bigger. And of course it has to go through the steps of, in essence, very similar to development to regenerate um, the bone, the muscles, the, the pattern bone and the blood vessels, everything. So uh, we wanted to ask to what extent the cells in the blastema um, become similar to the uh, developing embryonic limb bud cells. So we knew from many people's work that um, those genes that famous genes that are expressed in the limb bud like FGF8, Sonic Hedgehog uh, um, are, uh, are indeed uh, expressed in the blastema, but using single strength cell transcriptomics, we could get a more global overview. So then we uh, did profiled not only the, uh, took not only the regeneration time course, but we did single cell sequencing of early and later limb buds. And in this case, we uh, performed an analytical method called quadratic programming, where we identified uh, genes that are characteristic and specific to uninjured the pre-regeneration cells, um, then a set of genes that are characteristic for the late limb bud cells. 
and then similar for five day uh, uh, and 11 day um, uh, uh, blastema cells. And so then we, we, um, we plot each cell according to what percentage of its transcriptome is, uh, uh, what percentage of the uninjured genes are expressed by um, each cell. And so, of course, you can see the cells sitting in the mature tissue express a high proportion of the transcripts associated with uninjured um, state. But then as they go into uh, regeneration, the regenerating cells, of course, then are expressing some um, transient um, state. And interestingly, by day 11 in the blastema, um, the 11-day blastema cells are very similar to the embryonic and uh, the early and late limb bud cells. So this uh, for us was the first really, you know, uh, way of looking comprehensively at gene expression states uh, to say that these fibroblasts were going through some kind of unique state to then de-differentiate to an embryonic limb bud like progenitor cell. Um, and we could identify a number of genes that are associated with these different time points and states. And uh, of course, these are interesting to know how they play a role uh, during this de-differentiation process. So um, we, we uh, wanted to confirm um, this concept that these blastema cells had de-differentiated into a multipotent progenitor. And we knew from um, clonal li lineage tracing studies in the chicken and the mouse limb bud that early limb bud progenitor cells are indeed multipotent. So they're multipotent um, connective tissues, uh, 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 stem cells, in the sense that if you label a single cell in the early mouse or chicken limb bud, then the descendants of that cell will contribute to cartilage, bone, ligaments, tendons, uh, and dermis. So this is the classic connective tissue compartment. So we wanted to ask whether um, the blastema cells that were being produced have this multipotent uh, uh, skeletal stem cell properly, property. And so uh, using the single cell data, uh, we did this uh, diffusion analysis to, to look at a, a trajectory, uh, an in silico trajectory, looking at the similarity of cells to each other uh, and then um, arraying them in, uh, according to their similarity. And this trajectory predicted that indeed we have multipotent progenitors um, that uh, as we go into uh, regeneration over time, that these are then uh, have descendants that form um, dermis, uh, bone and cartilage cells, suggesting there's a multipotent progenitor cell in the blastema. But to really nail that down, we again turn to our rainbow animal in a slightly different long-term um, lineage tracing mode uh, to ask if we clonally label cells in the blastema, uh, will they form, form a similar multipotent, um, have a similar multipotency as in development? And um, here you see multiple colors. In the rainbow, in our rainbow animal, if we treat the animal with a Cree, then we observed that this blue color was recombining, was appearing at uh, a very low frequency. And uh, we calculated that this blue color was uh, appearing so that it would be present to either zero, one, or two cells at the, at, at the amputation plane. So then we amputated the limbs and then followed the limbs and then looked for where we found blue cells in the regenerated structure. Uh, and here you can see the results here. So it, the blue color in the regenerated structure were found in the skeleton, in the periskeleton, the loose connective tissues and the tendons. Uh, and, uh, um, and so this um, confirmed that uh, during regeneration, we generate a multipotent progenitor cell in the blastema. So we're pretty confident that we can say that fibroblasts sitting in a mature tissue migrate into the blastema, something about being at the tip of the blastema um, and probably the injury itself induces them to de-differentiate into a limb bud uh, multipotent progenitor cell. So this is just to kind of um, spatially um, summarize this data. 
you amputate the limb. These green cells are these fibroblasts. They're in the dermis. They're in interstitium, what, what we call the interstitium sitting between muscle fibers. They're wrapped around the bone. Um, when you amputate, the skin crawls over the end of the limb. Then um, a callus forms at the end of this bone and then um, cells migrate into the blastema uh, and uh, go, go to the tip. And then these uh, fibroblasts coming from the interstitium and the dermis uh, regenerate the bone and the tendons and the ligaments. Uh, they're just not shown here. Okay, so the hallmarks of regenerative fibroblasts based on these studies is that they can de-differentiate to make a multipotent skeletal progenitor and that upper leg skin fibroblasts can contribute to the regenerated foot. So having defined these characteristics, then we wanted to ask what about the fibroblasts in animals that don't manage to regenerate. So in order to address that, we decided to make a head-to-head -head comparison between the axolotl and the frog, uh, where in the frog, you amputate the limb and it uh, forms a blastema actually, but this blastema does not complete regeneration. It forms this spike of cartilage, but there's no muscle inside the spike. Um, and you can see that this bone is not patterned at all. So this is work from Tsiang Lin, Yuka, Taniguchi, Sugiura, and then Tobias Gerber and, and Barbara Troilein, who are our collaborators on all our single cell work. So we just right away that uh, also did uh, single cell sequencing of a regeneration time course uh, where you can see this UMAP representation clustering of um, the regeneration time points, zero days, three days, uh, seven days, 10, 14, uh, 20, and 52. And uh, you can see that they cluster in a kind of time course and then eventually end up in two branches. And then please note here, there's a kind of separate mini time course going on here. Um, if we annotate what kind of genes are being expressed at, um, in cells at the different locations, uh, we can see that um, these cells in red here seem to be expressing interstitial fibroblast genes. And then they, these turn into blastema cells, um, while well, these are cells collected from the blastema. But then at late time points, uh, the cells are uh, starting to form cartilage or fibroblasts. Um, now, uh, if we look at this small second uh, time course here, this uh, based on gene annotation seems to be composed of dermal fibroblasts. Um, this is the percentage composition of the mature limb um, of, of these uh, cell types. Oops. Okay, so um, the prediction actually from these UMAPs was that uh, the cells and maybe the interstitial fibroblasts were going into the blastema and then they were the cells that were bifurcating and some of the descendants were forming the spike of cartilage um, and others were uh, reforming uh, interstitial fibroblast cells or dermis. So we wanted to test that uh, from a cell tracing point of view. So in this case, we didn't use clonal tracing, but rather we transplanted um, tissue from a venous expressing um, frog into an unlabeled host. And then we amputated, and then we looked at how the uh, cells from this transplant integrated into the blastema. So uh, here's this, this panel here is, is like here. And so in this case, we um, transplanted a piece of muscle, but since the muscle doesn't, since muscle cells don't contribute to the blastema, these green cells that we're seeing here in the blastema are the interstitial fibroblasts that were in this muscle um, tissue. And uh, you can see here that cells are going into the blastema, they're forming blastema, but a number of them have contributed to this um, cartilage, which is expressing SOX9, and they've turned on SOX9. So this uh, confirms the UMAP data that cells from the interstitium seem to go into the blastema and some of them can uh, form SOX9 positive cartilage. Tendon was pretty amazing. So we transplanted a piece of GFP tendon and then those <clears throat> cells very readily migrated into the blastema and many of those descendants actually turned into SOX9 positive cartilage. Uh, 
So uh, the tendon seems to be, seems to be uh, populated by a highly potent um, cell for making cartilage. And then interestingly, when we transplant skin, including the dermis, the cells do migrate into the blastema, but they always stay next to the epidermis and maintain their own layer. Again, confirming the UMAP data that there's a separate small time course going on within the dermis itself. And you can see here that hardly any cells have contributed to the um, uh, SOX9 positive cartilage. So somehow the dermal cells remain as a separate layer in the, in the frog blastema, whereas in the axolotl blastema, the dermal cells were readily contributing to the blastema and making um, cells that would eventually uh, contribute to the cartilage. So uh, now in order to, um, to calculate uh, which which cell types were really the significant contributors to the regenerating SOX9 positive cartilage, uh, we calculated the amount of muscle, the amount of dermis, the amount of tendon at the amputation plane. And then uh, depending on the percentages of SOX9 positive cartilage that uh, was being formed here in these images, we could calculate the um, kind of um, contribution of each tissue layer to the regenerating cartilage spike. And so based on those calculations, we can say that 86% of the interstitial, uh, of the SOX9 positive cartilage comes from interstitial cells. 10% of the SOX9 positive cartilage comes from tendon. And only 3.8% of the cells at most are coming from the dermis. So this is just another way of um, uh, making trajectories out of single cell data using a program called SPRING, uh, which confirms uh, the trajectories that uh, interstitial fibroblasts go into the blastema and their descendants uh, do contribute to cartilage and into fibroblasts. And interestingly, when we look at this time course, at the uh, gene annotation at the different time uh, points, uh, this progression is very similar to what we saw during axolotl regeneration. The activation of an innate immunity response, disassembly of the ECM, cell proliferation, then intermediate filament and ECM reorganization at the late time points of regeneration. So th that sense the frog was similar to the axolotl, just in terms of the types of um, uh, genes and processes uh, the cells seem to be going through. Now, remember that quadratic programming that we did in the axolotl, uh, progr quadratic programming analysis we did in the axolotl. And this is the same analysis depicted here uh, in a slightly different way. So um, here you see the um, axolotl limb bud samples. And uh, uh, we, you can't see it here, but there's a y-axis here where on the top at one are the limb bud genes. So a cell that expresses 100% of the limb bud genes would be up here. And then down on the bottom are the genes representing the, the cells expressed by mature fibroblasts. So again, we took these characteristic sets of genes, again, also depicted here. Here are the mature uh, cell transcripts. These are the embryonic uh, limb transcripts. And so you can see that the embryonic, axolotl embryonic limb bud cells in, are indeed distributing uh, very close to one. Uh, so they're expressing the embryonic limb bud transcripts. Now, if you look at the axolotl regeneration time course, um, you see that the mature fibroblasts are expressing the mature uh, genes. And then already at day five, and then increasingly at day 11 and 18, you see that a larger and larger number of the axolotl blastema cells are coming quite close to the pure embryonic limb bud signature. So again, this uh, indicates that the axolotl fibroblasts are de-differentiating to an embryonic limb bud-like identity during regeneration. Now, what about the frog? So we use the same analysis, the same genes uh, with the frog sequencing data sets. So here's the uh, frog embryonic limb bud um, data uh, cells. And then here the, is the regeneration time course. So again, you can see that the embryonic frog embryonic limb bud cells are um, 
uh, a high proportion of the cells are expressing this limb bud identity genes. Uh, but now if you look here, here's the fibroblasts expressing the fibroblast genes. And then as you go through regeneration, um, fewer of the cells, the cells are kind of shutting off the fibroblast genes, but they're actually not coming very close to the limb bud uh, identities. So very few of the cells are expressing a significant number of the embryonic limb bud type of genes. So our first uh, conclusion from this type of analysis is that the Xenopus uh, cells, when they enter the blastema, do not get fully reprogrammed to a full embryonic limb phenotype. And this is another way of uh, doing the analysis. Here we array the, um, the axolotl um, blastema time course and the limb bud time course on a U map. And then uh, we asked the harmony program to harmonize these data sets. Okay, so this is kind of going backwards. We're saying, okay, now from our previous analysis, uh, we are saying that the limb bud and the blastema um, cells uh, become very similar during regeneration. And so we're saying that, um, and you know, harmony is usually used to harmonize different batches of data uh, you know, across experiments. But we used it in this way to say, okay, what conditions does Harmony uh, come up with in order to um, harmonize the limb bud samples with the exotal blastema samples? And then we took the same settings and then applied it to the Xenopus limb bud experiment. And here you can see that under those conditions where you get an overlap between the blastema and limb bud samples in the axolotl, uh, you don't get an overlap between the Xenopus limb bud and the Xenopus blastema. So they continue to remain separate. So it's another piece of evidence that the frog blastema cells don't become close, uh, as close to the limb bud um, phenotype as axolotl cells do. So having this interesting piece of information, we wanted to know why is this failing? Why is this reprogramming failing in the Xenopus? Is it because after metamorphosis, the frog has something in its circulatory system? It could be immune cells, it could be something else that's blocking these blastema cells from fully entering an embryonic limb program? Or are the uh, fibroblast cells themselves somehow intrinsically limited in their potential? So is there some, for example, epigenetic modifications of their genome that prevents them from firing the embryonic limb bud genes. So in order to test that, we took uh, this approach where we wanted to do a classic embryonic potential type experiment. So we wanted to put the Xenopus blastema cells into a permissive environment that would allow them to show their potential. So in this case, we took cherry expressing transgenic frog blastema cells transplanted them into a frog limb bud. And then we wanted to know whether these cells would contribute to the skeleton and whether they would contribute to the patterned foot skeleton. And the control here is to transplant limb bud cells to limb bud. And the other control is axolotl blastema cells to axolotl limb bud. Um, okay, so then here's the control the Xenopus limb bud to limb bud. This should contribute to foot skeleton. Otherwise our transplantations are not very good. And so here's the limb that developed from this limb bud. We see here in white, the fluorescence signal from the transplanted cells. And we cross section here in stain for SOX9. We see that a number of the transplanted cells have contributed to SOX9 positive cartilage in the foot. Okay, so our transplantation technique is good. So now we transplant the frog blastema cells into the frog limb bud. And then uh, we get the outgrowth of the limb. We see uh, cells uh, resident here. And now when we section, we look at the cartilage and there are no SOX9 positive cells um, in these transplants. All the cells seem to be kind of like in dermal fibroblasts. They, in fact, they seem to have a kind of myofibroblast phenotype. So uh, this confirms, this says that some, even though the frog blastema cells are put in a in permissive environment, they are unable to form embryonic uh, foot cartilage. Um, 
So this just summarizes all the transplantation uh, experiments here. This is the X level positive control, limb bud to limb bud. We get uh, SOX9 positive cells in the foot. Uh, X level blastema into limb bud, we get SOX9 positive cells in the foot. Uh, even when we transplant directly fact sorted at adult fibroblasts into an X level limb bud, we get SOX9 positive cells in the foot. And then here's the limb bud to limb bud transplant in the frog, and then the blastema to limb bud transplant in the frog, <clears throat> where we get no SOX9 positive cartilage. And interestingly, if we transplant these blastema cells back into a blastema, they contribute very well to the spike cartilage, uh, <clears throat> which makes sense. So we wanted to look at a molecular level what was happening there. So we did one of these transplants of the frog blastema into a frog limb bud. The blastema cells were green, the host limb bud cells were red. Then we waited three days, dissociated and performed single cell sequencing. And you can see the UMAP representation here. So in green, this is the host limb bud cells. In blue, light blue are the donor blastema cells before the transplantation. And in dark blue here, are the blastema cells after they've been transplanted into the limb bud. So again, you can see that these cells don't uh, resemble the limb bud cells, but rather even though they've been transplanted into the limb bud, they very much resemble the transplanted blastema cells. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can just see that again in the heat maps uh, here. Here are the host limb bud cells here are the donor blastema cells before transplantation. And then in blue are the um, cells after transplantation. So in essence, somehow it looks like the frog blastema cells are deaf to the uh, embryonic environmental signals are unable to de-differentiate. Okay. So um, we followed up on this observation that the frog blastema cells can make cartilage in the blastema, but not in the limb bud. So Toby identified a number of uh, genes that are annotated to be involved in cartilage formation during development and in regeneration. And he asked uh, the adult cells and the embryonic limb bud cells, um, how, do, how many of these uh, cartilage genes do they express? And so he made a kind of cartilage score. And you can see that the axolotl uh, limb blastema and the axolotl limb bud cells have uh, a very similar distribution along this cartilage score axis. Now, in contrast here in the frog um, adult blastema, you see a very dispersed um, distribution of cells along this cartilage score, whereas in the uh, um, embryonic limb bud, um, of the frog, you don't. And you can see that better here, where for specific genes that are involved in cartilage formation, you can see that they, um, they distribute along the cartilage score extremely well, similarly in the axolotl, but the embryonic and the mature cells um, show very different profiles um, along the um, uh, um, along the axis, along the cartilage score axis. So from this, we conclude that the cartilage program that's going on during development and that results in pattern cartilage is very different from the cartilage formation program that's going on in the adult that results in just a spike and a non-patterned cartilage. So I think I'm running out of time. I think I'm gonna skip this. This is rather complex um, about patterning. So I think I'm gonna to finish here. So basically our studies indicate that the after metamorphosis, the fog fibroblasts seem to be intrinsically incapable of de-differentiating into multipotent limb skeletal progenitor cell. So uh, we're very much interested in, in what are the modifications to the chromatin and the DNA that might lead to this impotency uh, for the frog cells to de-differentiate fully. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we think the cartilage differentiation program differs significantly during development as compared to a post-metamorphic bone growth. And the data I didn't show you is that the derangement of, there's a derangement of positional identity genes like the Hox genes 
uh, uh, during this um, abortive frog regeneration, whereas we get a very beautiful um, uh, expression, uh, proper uh, spatial expression of positional identity genes during x level regeneration. So we think that these are the kind of some of the primary uh, aspects um, that are keeping the frog from fully regenerating a limb. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and thank the people um, in the lab. The first part of the work, the axolotl work was performed by Prayag Murawala, the single cell sequencing together with Tobias Gerber, Gray Camp, and Barbara Troitline. Uh, you saw Josh Curry's movie, so the Rainbow axolotl. Then the second part of the work, uh, the frog work, was performed by a graduate student, Tiang Ling, and, a, uh, and technician, Yuka uh, Sugiura. And again, in collaboration with Tobias Gerber, Gray Camp, and Barbara Troy Lai. Um, so I will stop there and thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is always very interesting to see all these different possibilities about differentiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, we, I think we have, um, well, already. Alfredo already said that if we have questions, you can put them directly on the chat or raise your hand. So let's, Luis Covarrubias has one already. So let's give him. Okay. Luis, would you like to go ahead? Um, um, I thank you very much, Lee Tanaka, for your talk. It was really very interesting. Uh, it helped me a lot uh, to understand much better what's happening in the absolute in regeneration. Um, I have several questions that I know uh, if are, I'm going to confuse more about this uh, phenomenon. But uh, you know that fibroblast is kind of a very vague name for a cell type. Then when you say fibroblast, I, I don't know if you know if how heterogeneous are the fibroblasts that you find. For instance, if, if within that population there is kind of a let's say kind of reservoir with stem cells that yeah. actually those are the ones that are capable of the yes. differentiation which they like like that and and those are the ones that form the blastema but those blastema that is different to the frog that are the blastema that have this uh, multi-potential yes. capacity um i know how you can say about this yes, possibility yeah, yeah so in the axolotl we're a little bit more confident so although the fibroblasts are pretty heterogeneous in the mature uh limb both from josh's movies and from the single cell sequencing the data suggests that even though you have heterogeneous fibroblasts a large proportion of them are de-differentiating to this state so uh, we don't think that in x model there are kind of particular like uh, very selected reservoirs of cells that are selected into the blastema. I mean, we do know there's some selections uh, and we think that's based on migration and not necessarily actually a potency beforehand. So um, cells that are e more easily converted by this PRX CRE reporter actually seem to have a slight advantage to get into the blastema. Um, and, and, and PRX is, high, is associated with uh, cell migration. So we think that some cells might have a migration um, uh, advantage to get to the tip of the blastema. And once they're at the tip of the blastema, they would de-differentiate. Uh, so yes, I mean, some cells might be easier to de-differentiate than others, but our current feeling is that most of the fibroblasts that are there, these kind of um, connective tissue cells sitting between the muscles, sitting around the, uh, uh, the Schwann cells, sitting in the dermis, that most of them are capable of doing this de-differentiation. And, and one reason is that we could take the time points with, uh, with very, you know, with very, with almost no cell divisions in between. Uh, in the frog, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because their cell cycle is faster and, you know, we were dealing with more cells so, uh, so, you know, it could be possible that there are some cells that might be more competent to regenerate than other ones in the frog. Uh, and whether there are any cells that would be capable of going fully into regeneration, we, we can't completely exclude, but we didn't really see signs of that 
although we transplanted cells from many different time points of regeneration actually into that limb bud transplantation assay. Uh, so at the moment, we have not found a, a cell subpopulation that seems to be fully competent yet. The thing, the experiment that we really wanted to do but couldn't do is to transplant the frog cells into the axolotl just to make sure that the axolotl environment would not actually cause the frog cells to fully de-differentiate, but it was too difficult with cross-species rejection type of things. Yeah. Okay, I, actually I was going to ask that, but, but for instance, the one the experiment that you could do, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I, I, I probably missed it, is if you have tried to transplant uh, uh, from the embryo, the frog embryo into the adult blastema. I mean, uh, if this has intrinsic property, those yeah. that are in the embryo have the potential to differentiate to the yes, uh, yes. sub nine post cells. Right, so actually uh, Jonathan Slack's lab did that a number of years ago. So they took a lot of limb bud cells. They, they actually expressed a kind of constitutively active beta catenin in the cells and they co-transplanted with sonic hedgehog and they did a lot of, uh, they, you know, kind of boosted the cells. But if they did that and transplanted a lot of embryonic cells into the, uh, into the froglet, into the froglet blastema, they could actually see digits forming and, and even recruitment of, of adult cells into the regenerates. So the embryonic cells can promote regeneration in the adult context. Okay, well, according with the, this view, it appears that re, the regeneration capacity is an intrinsic property of the cells, right? It's yes. not actually, it's only an environment, but it's an intrinsic property of those fibroids that are in the axle. Um, and just my last, my last question is, is, I mean, you know that long time ago, this, this comparison between the ca cancer development and regeneration. And one of the same view is that the Oh, so, something happens. With, happened. With, <laughs> we lost him. <laughs> he got frozen. <laughs> oh no! Well, I don't know what happened, but oh, maybe, well, maybe he will come back to the next question, and right. then if he's yeah. connected again, he he can ask later. Yes, if, if it's possible. So, Salvador. Salvador. Uh, first, thank you for this great talk. I am a truly lover of Axolot, so I was very excited of this. Uh -huh. And I have two questions. First, uh, I have read that the the Axolots have and these muscle satellite cells, and they manage the regeneration of the muscular tissue of the limb. Yes. And I want to ask why the uh, the differentiated uh, fibroblast uh, doesn't uh, have this task of regenerating the muscle. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, that's also the other interesting, let's say, epigenetic question is is when the when these fibroblasts de-differentiate, why they only de-differentiate back to the lateral plate mesoderm identity and not to an earlier identity. Uh, so I, I guess there must be some, yeah, as I say, epigenetic threshold that they don't overcome and they only go back to this lateral plate mesoderm descendant, which is, uh, which is separate from the Semitic mesoderm cell, uh, you know, in development. And so we think that it's just going back a certain way in development before going on. And, and therefore then it's the muscle satellite cells that regenerate the muscle in, um, in the limb. But interestingly, uh, we've been using the same transgenics to follow tail regeneration and uh, in tail regeneration, actually, there is a cell in the sitting in the tail that can regenerate both the muscle and the uh, cartilage and the uh, fibroblast. So there's a cell that's more uh, potent in um, in the tail to regenerate muscle and, and connective tissue. Thanks. That sounds interesting. And my other question is, uh, if there what are the perspective of epigenomic features of the axolotl genome? And uh -huh. especially if the, if the polycom and tritorax complex are known uh, or are studied about uh, in, in yes. these animal models. Yes. So we have found orthologs of all those proteins uh, in the axolotl genome. And we're performing just now, actually, we working out the methods and, and performing ATAC seq and chip, actually not chip seq, but cut and tag in order to be able to profile the histone marks uh, in regeneration. 
just at the well beginning. thank you so much so we have a couple of questions that are on the chat maybe i i read them do you mm -hmm. agree yes so marta vasquez is asking it looked to me that your general conclusions are similar to the ones obtained with trans determination and regeneration studies in drosophila can you tell us something about those similarities Yes, I guess um, trans determination. Um, yeah, uh, maybe yes and no. I, I thought that in Drosophila, if you kind of incubate these uh, cells through, pass them through the mother a number of times, these wing disc cells, they can form leg disc cells. It's still, um, I think, unless you push the cells really hard in axolotl, uh, we think that the like fore limb cells don't tend to form hind limb cells, but it could be that we don't have the equivalent of passing the cells through the mother multiple times. So I, I, I think that's still an open question. Um, in terms of wing disc regeneration, yes, I think it's interesting because um, you generally seem to uh, remain in like, let's say compartment boundaries uh, in the wing disc, but under cer certain circumstances at the boundary, you, you might be able to cross over. So um, there may be similar type of crossing over. So, well, like this, this uh, the, the, the dermal cells um, uh, being able to go back and, and make the stem cell that's, that's uh, potent to form the skeleton could be a very similar process. Uh, yeah, and, you know, that's interesting that I think in Drosophila, you see an upregulation of MMPs at the beginning of regeneration, and you see this also in axolotl. And I think in Drosophila, you they need they see a reduction of polycomb levels at the beginning of, of Drosophila wing disc re regeneration. We're interested to know whether a similar process happens during axolotl regeneration. Yeah, hi, hi, I'm Marta. Hi. Uh, yes, dude, you are right. Yeah, apparently it's polycom, which is directing this regeneration in Drosophila. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, we still need to test that. In but we know trithorax is involved so far as a main pathway to the differentiate. Yes. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting. Thank you. So we have one more question on the chat from Monica Garcia, thank you for this fascinating talk. It is very interesting that in the frog, the cells reach an intermediate embryonic limb cell state, not a complete one as in the axolotl. Could it be that, the, that this cell state transition happens too slow in frogs, slower than the regeneration window? And this is why they don't end up contributing to regeneration. Yeah, no, that's a very, uh, it's a very uh, insightful point. This is something we were worried about that maybe when we transplant the frog cells into the limb bud, the whole uh, developmental process is going so quickly that, um, that they miss the window um, to de-differentiate. Um, we have not performed serial transplantations to see whether we could actually promote um, the uh, whether we could promote the um, regeneration. But, you know, we were quite struck that after transplanting the cells, you know, and you would think signaling happens very quickly, you know, we collected those cells three days afterwards. And when we did single cell sequencing, the, you know, the blastema cells look almost like, you know, normal. And, and so, um, so, and, and also, the cells that came closest to being a limb bud-like cell were the cells actually at the earliest time point, um, you know, after injury. So we were wondering whether actually they open up and then and then they actually very quickly close down um, their program. So we tried um, transplanting earlier cells, but we still didn't see this um, opening up to a full uh, developmental state. So now we're actually identifying we have genes that are that are missing in the blastema cells compared to the limb bud of the frog and the limb bud of the axolotl and the blastema of the axolotl. And we're trying to transfer those cells into the frog blastema cells and see whether they become fully potent. So, um, so I, 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 I have a question too. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, Yvonne. So um, 
you you showed us that the innate immune response has a very important role in regeneration and uh, you know there's all this con- intermixing between the immune protection and the, the role of immunity in uh, development mm-hmm. and um, is it possible that you know assuming that those fibroblasts that you're using in the frog are exactly all the same ones and uh, or what Luis Covarrubias uh, uh, also mentioned, um, is it possible that you're missing that the frog's immune, innate immune system is slightly different to that one, to the one on the axolotl, and that would be interesting. And then that the differences between one being able to regenerate and the other not a complete limb yeah. um, comes from, you know, some... Yes, it could be, although we we are thinking maybe not because, you know, when we transplanted the frog, well, it could be in the adult that in addition, this there is something in the innate immune system that's blocking regeneration. But when we transplant the blastema cells into the limb bud stage of the xenopus, at that stage, those animals can regenerate. So if you amputate the, the developing limb bud, they're able to regenerate. So, so that stage, they must either have a different innate immune system or the innate immune system not. Um, but that is really possible. Yes, yes, no, definitely, yes, yeah. That is really possible that it's not exactly the same thing. I mean, yes. you know, the, the proportions between different factors and cells and so yes. on. Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I, the in, immune system is changing a huge amount during that time. Yeah. So I was thinking, could you, you know, your transplantation experiment between species is definitely difficult. Yes. But could you sort of um, make an in vitro culture of your limbs that are regenerating somehow and use those supernatants as a source of innate immune uh, factors that would yes. contribute? Too. Yeah, actually, there's a paper that uh, that appeared four days ago in development, where a young researcher uh, from Cambridge named Ken Aztekin, um, he did those experiments in Xenopus, actually. And uh, he basically showed that as the limb matures, uh, it, it didn't have so much to do with the immune system. But as you get kind of more and more differentiated limb tissue, like the like the bone, um, those uh, those cells seem to be secreting um, an inhibitor like noggin, which seems to actually prevent the um, apical ectodermal ridge from um, forming in in the in the limb bud. So, and he did this by explants and conditioned media and this that and the other. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I I have uh, two two questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, very fast. So. Uh, one of the differences between Xenopus and the axolot is, is the cell cycle of, of the cells. So you mentioned that the cell cycle in, in the axolot only takes four days. Yeah. And Xenop- Xenopus is faster. So do you think that this is the extension of very long cell cycle is a requirement to, to have this potential to oh. regenerate? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, actually, we really desperately want to do an experiment where we block the cell cycle and see whether the cells can still de-differentiate, but uh, we haven't done it yet. But uh, whether having a slow cell cycle helps, I don't know. I think they have a slow, uh, they have a slow cell cycle because they have such a large genome. And um, so I don't know whether and there's an additional time component. It would be interesting. as. Yeah, in terms of this idea of, of whether you pass a kind of, you know, if you have more time to go through the process, whether you can maybe dismantle the whole uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, cell machinery better, yeah, differentiated cell machinery better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the other it probably is kind of kind of crazy idea. Uh, uh, can you can you uh, electroporate or somehow transfect the the uh, blastema cells in Sinopus? with RNA from the axolot, from the same. Oh, yeah, 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 no, that would be definitely interesting. Yes, yes. Uh, so, I mean, we're culturing the frog cells now. The in vivo electroporation turns out to be quite difficult, but we can culture the blastema cells and we are transfecting them with plasmids. And so what we, as, as, as I said, we what we've done so far is to kind of is to identify 15 factors that are expressed in axolotl and, and xenopus limb bud uh, 
and axonal blastema, but not in, in the Xenopus blastema. We're trying to transfect those into the frog cells and then see what they do. Uh, I have thought about whether to do whole RNA from the X level. Now I think it would be super interesting, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, we have one more question from the YouTube listeners and uh, it says, parametation, if you transplant cancerous tissues into a re regenerating limb, does the cancerous tissue get reprogrammed into healthy tissue or does cancer get spread into the healthy tissue? Yes, yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. I mean, so I guess uh, people have done this for in development, like uh, they've taken, in, I think in chicken, melanoma cells and transplanted into neural crest. And then this developmental setting controls the melanoma. Um, they've also done it, I think in mouse blastocysts, they've transplanted like mouse cancer cells into the mouse blastocyst and then they contribute to the developing embryo without forming a tumor. Um, it hasn't been done in that way in X level, but uh, there have been a number of studies where people treat regenerating tissue in the salamander, especially the lens with carcinogens. And also people have done it for the limb. And then uh, when you, you get extra cells, but then those extra cells tend to differentiate into the re structure they should regenerate like the lens or the limb. So actually I would suspect that if you had a tumor in uh, the limb blastema um, environment might be able to control the tumor, yes. Can I okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Katya, yeah, you should add to it. <laughs> well, um, Takis did those experiments very long time ago when he was doing his PhD and he put a carcinogen in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, area of a dilated limb and instead of getting a, a cancerous growth, he got a second limb. Yes. There seems to be a, quite a bit of um, repurposing and just taking over of the program. And we, we try to put carcinogens too in the eye as uh, Eguchi did with the lens regeneration and we never really got a tumor and Eguchi actually got a second second lens. Mm -hmm. There is, seems to be a resistance and uh, resistance to, to tumor genesis as well. But, uh, Ellie, I had a question for you in terms of the, uh, the frog. Uh, when you were doing all your single cell RNA sequencing, you concentrated on the post-metamorphic, right? Mm -hmm. Studies in the uh, pre-metamorphic and see how that compared to the axolotl program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we didn't do that. Yeah, we, I, I, um, yes, I, we, we did transplant the blastema cells into the limb, but in the in the pre-metamorphic uh, regeneration competence stage, and they did actually, you know, make foot cartilage, but we haven't sequenced the, the pre-metamorphic stage. But this was done by Ken, this this paper that's now in development. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's worth checking his, his, his paper. Actually, it's very interesting, yeah. Can I ask one more thing? I don't know if you've done this because I lost track, you're doing so much cool stuff. Um, have you tried to uh, inhibit or deplete the satellite cells of the muscle and try to see if the interstitial or the fibroblast cells will take over? To, re to make Yeah, it so we have not done it that way, but you know, when we made that PAX-7 knockout, that didn't have any muscle cells in the limb to begin with. And then uh, if you amputate that, that limb will regenerate, um, uh, but with no muscle. Mm -hmm. But we haven't done a kind of depletion of a normal limb and then ask if the satellite cells take over, uh, if the connective tissue cells take over, yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I guess we have no more. Is there any other question? I don't know whether Luis is back online. <laughs> no, we haven't recovered him. I am. I am back. I am back. Oh, I, can, yeah, yeah. I cannot. <laughs> I just. I just want to finish with one uh, very simple question: If have you analyzed the epigenetic characteristics of those fibroblasts? For instance, if there is a, a epigenetic mark that seems that those fibroblasts are alike, for instance, embryonic stem cells or or yes. things like that. Yeah, no, no, we're just doing that now. So we're just doing atex profiling of the fibroblasts and also of my, mouse fibroblasts to see whether there are different regions of open chromatin and whether you can see the, um, the embryonic uh, signature already in the mature fibroblast. 
uh, it's kind of seems to be a kind of mixed situation. So for example, what we are looking at the Hox gene complex and uh, you definitely see, for example, in the upper arm that the that Hox A13, the hand Hox A13 is closed, uh, but the upper arm Hox A9 does already seem to be open um, in the mature state already. Uh, so I think there is a lot of poised chromatin um, ready to turn on that embryonic program probably, but we just need to do more analysis. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So well, it's good that you get back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it froze all of a sudden. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, very stimulating to talk and it was a very nice experience for me. Thank you so much. And uh, as I said, we would very much have liked to have you here, but it will have to wait for better times, vaccines and PCRs and masks yeah. and everything. Yes. <laughs> Probably in a couple of years. Yeah. Something like and that. also when my, my kids are almost graduated, my son just graduated from high school this year, my daughter in two years, and then I think I'll be a little bit less hectic. <laughs> <laughs> You know, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> In French, there is this saying that says that you have small kids, you have small problems, and you have big kids, you have big problems. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, so far, so, teenagers are sort of okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you will have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank well, you thank you. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you for giving us that, so much of your time. Thank you. <laughs>